Hebrews chapter number 13. We'll begin reading verse number 7. The Bible says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. We're thankful for the good singing, the good time of fellowship before the service, the good testimonies. And Lord, we are thankful for this grand privilege to be able to come to the house of God tonight. Now, Father, you know what we stand in need of, and I pray for the next few minutes you'd put a hedge about us. I pray that you'd help us to bring our minds and our thoughts under submission. God, I pray that you'd bless the reading of the Word of God. God, bless the preaching of it. God, may it stir us... Uh, May it cause us, Lord, uh, 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 to grow closer to God. May we uh, ever strive uh, 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 to yield ourselves more than we ever have. And God, send revival in these days. Uh, Lord, there's nothing uh, in this world that could not be fixed uh, 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 by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God, I pray that folks would start submitting unto Him, uh, giving their lives to Him. Uh, sinners start getting saved by Him. Uh, God, I say we uh, pray that we'd see a great move of God in these days. Uh, may it begin in us here tonight. Uh, may you do something great and supernatural. Uh, God, be with that one that is hurting tonight. Uh, be with that one that is seeking, that one that is low. Uh, God, you know our needs. So, Father, just blow through here and help us. Uh, God, use this unworthy vessel now. Uh, and help us to sit in heavenly places. We'll bless you for it. Uh, for it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Uh, amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to these verses. Uh, way of introduction, bring out a few things. I want you to notice, first of all, the servant in verse number 7. Uh, says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you uh, the word of God, uh, whose faith... Uh, follow. Uh, now the Bible says the man of God rules over them. Uh, can I say he never put himself in that position? Uh, he most likely didn't even sign up for that position. Uh, God's the one that called him. God's the one that uh, schooled him. God's the one that put him in the ministry. Uh, and then God's the one that put him in the position uh, to be the pastor, uh, the one who speaks the word of God. Uh, He's just a servant. Uh, but my dear friends, uh, the Bible says uh, to remember them, uh, to obey them, uh, and to follow their faith. Uh, can I say one day, my dear friends, there's been a lot of things you've watched me go through uh, and you've seen how I've handled it. Uh, then when you got to go through something, uh, you don't handle it the same way. You know why? You're not following the same faith. Uh, that I followed in. Uh, there are some of you uh, that have done better than I've done. Uh, but I'm telling you, a lot of times, uh, uh, something comes into your life, you fall apart uh, because you've not followed the example. Uh, 
Can I say Jesus was the ultimate example? Uh, that's why he gave us the Gospels. Uh, 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 in him uh, and in his earthly ministry and earthly walk, uh, we can find out how to handle anything that comes our way. Uh, and then God's put people in your life. Uh, and he's put a pastor in your life uh, uh, to show you how to conduct yourself when troubles come. Mark her down, trouble's coming. Mm, sickness is coming. Problems are coming. And the truth of the matter is, I said I'll be here Sunday, two days after surgery, and y'all smir smirked and laughed, but most of you know I'll be here. Yeah, amen. Mm, some of you get a little paper cut and you can't come to church. Mm. Will I be hurting when I come? Sure, I'm having surgery. I'm having a bone fused in my neck. Probably not an easy surgery. Having a bone taken out of my hip, not a lot of fun. But if I can make it, you want to mark her down, I'll be here. Why? Because I want to impress you? No. I mean, I'll be hurting at the house. Might as well come to the house of God. Maybe hear something about Jesus. I've found this. It don't matter what I'm going through. If I can get to the house of God, it seems like it flees. Mm. But a lot of people that sit around the house suck their thumbs. Anyway, that's a whole other message. Uh. I got it so bad. Well, why don't you go down to the house of God? You might get glad. Hmm. But we see the servant in verse number 7. Notice the standard in verse number 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. I'm glad there's no variance with him. There's no changing with him. I'm glad he's the solid rock, aren't you? I'm glad, hallelujah, that uh, he's the same yesterday, today and forevermore. Uh, but he is our standard. He's the one we look to. He's our pri uh, prime example. Uh, 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 he's the one who grant our faith to grow. He's the standard. We see the servant. We see the standard. Now, notice in verses 9 through 12, they de he, the writer of Hebrews deals with separation. He says, Be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. I say hallelujah. Not with meats. He's talking about not the law. Which have profited them that have uh, been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat. Which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts. Those lambs. Those bulls. Uh, uh, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. Are burned without the camp. Uh, 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 he, he is teaching here that uh, everything they do was a picture uh, or a, a ceremony or a formality of who the standard is, the Lord Jesus. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, your heart ought to be established with grace, not the law. Uh, 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 the law was weak concerning the flesh. It couldn't redeem man. Uh, uh, my dear friends, Jesus Christ with his own blood uh, forgave us of all sin and redeemed us from sin. Uh, and let your heart be established with the good grace of God. Uh, not a bunch of rituals and legalism and a bunch of things that will not profit. Uh, so the separation is to separate away from uh, all that formality and all those strange doctrines and separate unto Christ. So we see the separation in verses 13 and 14. We see service. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. My dear friends, we're to bear the reproach of the Lord. and We're not to just hang out at the house of God. We're to take him outside the house of God uh, and take him to a lost and dying world and share the Lord Jesus uh, with this lost and dying world. Then we see spiritual sacrifices. Look in verse 15. It says, By him. Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. When you sacrifice the praise of your lips in song or testimony, it pleases God. When you do good to others, whether they deserve it or not, it pleases God. When you communicate to others the grace of God, it pleases God. Uh, those are spiritual sacrifices. Can I say, it's not easy, but it's right. Very important, all right? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for every animal that they would offer up in sacrifice, 
if it was a burnt offering, Brother Ray, they would go to the altar the first time with the head and all the skin and the fat and the inner parts. That's one trip to the altar. Then they would split the carcass in two and take that to the altar. That was one. If it was a large, like a bull, it might have been two trips. So now there are two, three times they went to the altar. And then they would take the legs and they'd wash those in water. And then they would take and offer the legs. So that's three or four trips to the altar for every sacrifice they made. Three or four trips. Can I say, serving God isn't easy. You may have to go to somebody's house three or four times before you get to communicate to them the good grace of God. But God is pleased with your sacrifice. He's pleased with your service when you go the extra mile to share with somebody else the goodness of God. And then I want you to notice the submission. And none of this is really what I'm going to preach on, but I'm just giving you what the text says. Verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Our text, we started out with the servant, we're ending with the servant. Both of them, it talks about the one that has the rule over you. In verse 7, we find out who that is, the one who uh, speaks to you the word of God. In verse 7, it says to remember him. In verse 17, it says to obey him. But also in verse 17, it says to submit yourself. So we see submission is being taught here. It goes on to say why you should submit yourself, for they watch for your souls. It says for you to submit to them that when they watch for your souls, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Mm-hmm. For that is unprofitable for you. Now notice the doctrine of submission right here. You submit to the one that has the rule over you. You know, we have a problem with authority. A lot of Americans have problems with police officers right now. They're people of authority. It amazes me how many mamas and daddies have problems with school teachers teaching their children. It's always uh, amazing how your child's the only one that gets homework, and your child's the only one that struggles in the class because the teacher's against you. Hogwash, your child struggles because you don't sit down with them and help them with their lessons at night. You don't read to them, you don't help them, you don't uh, uh, share with them the material and explain it to them so they get it themselves. Uh, you're too busy letting them uh, watch TV about eight hours a day. And so all they know is what Nickelodeon teaches them, not what the teacher did. It's always the teacher's fault. Hmm? It's amazing how many folks have rose-colored glasses. It amazes me how everybody that plays ball, the reason their kid's not the superstar is because coach hates them. Heard it a million times. Hmm? Listen. Let me help you with something. Coaches want to win. So they're going to try and play the best players they can. I, I remember one time hearing his mama complain about her child never getting to play and everything. So I, I go watch the little the little child's eating the grass, man. The kid he, he don't need to be on a ball field. I mean, the kid has no idea what's going on. He don't even know which hand to put the glove on. I mean, the kid, but he's a superstar, huh? We got a problem with submission. We got a problem with our boss on the job. It amazes me. Everybody that works a job knows more than the boss. And uh, they know more than the owner of the company. They've got all the answers. The problem is uh, they didn't put up their money to buy the company. Uh, 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 They aren't the one who's paying uh, uh, a salary for everybody and paying insurance for everybody and paying workman's comp on everybody. Uh, They're not the one competing with everybody else that has a business like this, uh, trying to make a profit so they can keep uh, uh, everybody working uh, 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 so everybody can have a job at Christmas time and everybody can put food on their table. Uh, 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 They don't uh, have to deal with the fact that suppliers can't get things because China owns everything now. Uh, and they're trying to get uh, supplies in so they can keep uh, production going so that everybody can keep their job and nobody gets laid off. Uh, uh, you don't see all of that stuff. All you see is you know more than the boss. Mm-hmm. 
And certainly you didn't get the raise and the promotion because, you know, the boss is related to somebody. See, people have a problem with authority. It's, it's everywhere. But can I say it's also filtered in the house of God. You know, that's just the preacher's opinion. He's only the preacher because everybody likes him. Uh, uh, he just, uh, 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 you know, that's just Doug up there. You know, the Bible still says, Touch not mine anointeth, saith the Lord. Right. Mm. Now, the man of God, he's human. He makes mistakes. By the way, he's got problems, too. You know, everybody thinks the man of God doesn't have any problems. He's got plenty of time. He's just waiting for you to call so he can solve all your problems. Uh, he only works three hours a week. That's the mentality of a lot of folks. But can I say, every day that you go on not esteeming the man of God as the most important voice in your life, you are a grief to him. And you're grieving the Holy Ghost. And that is not profitable for you. Hmm? He's God's man. Hmm, God placed him in that position. And God speaks through him to help you and your family. But every day you think you know more than him, you are hurting yourself because you're grieving God in your life. And he can't serve you with joy because you don't submit. And it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thing. There's a lot of folks that does not esteem the man of God. And therefore their life is in a mess and they don't even understand why. It would be a great day in your life. You realize that's God's man. And you respect him. You respect the office that he has. You pray for him. You ask God to give him what you and your family need. And you love him. And you just uh, hold him up before God. And you watch and see how your own life don't get better. That's God's man. And again, I'm not preaching on any of that. I'm interested tonight. Verse number 10, since I've already killed the service. <clears throat> I can preach that here because you all too t treat me good. But not everybody is submissive. Not everybody looks at the man of God like what he is. Uh, there's still some of you just walk up and call me by my first name. You better not let one of my boys hear you do that. Uh, they, won't, they won't take kindly to that. You know, I remember, and Brother Mike tell you, we remember... A day and age where you never called the preacher by his first name. It's always Brother Goodson. Or pastor. Or preacher. Never called him by the first name. I gave him years ago. Liberty called me Brother Doug. Because I started preaching. I was so young. I didn't, you know, Brother Foster sounded ancient. You call me Brother Foster now. I'm looking around to see who you're talking to. But nowhere have I ever said. Just come up and call me Doug. I just thought I'd throw that out there because some of you have a little problem with this. And if you don't get with me, I'll just stay right there. I don't care, you know. Hey, bless God, I'm, I'm going to North Carolina tomorrow night, so really, I don't care. I just, huh? But it's truth. Some of you got problems with authority. Hmm? Hmm? You do? Hmm? I'll never forget when my granddaddy told me, when the Lord led me over to Brother Pitt, my, my granddaddy told me, keep my mouth shut. Follow the man of God. You'll learn more following him than you ever learned at school. And you know what? He was right. And to this day, it's Brother Pittman to me. Never, never do I call him Brother Junior, Brother Pittman. If he called me today and told me he could do 50 push-ups, I couldn't do it. I'd die trying. Oh. Such a man of God. Hmm? Verse number 10 is where I want to get at since the rest of you have fainted now. The writer of Hebrews, and most people believe the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. Um, we don't know who wrote it because the Holy Ghost, he's the one that penned it down. You know, the Holy Ghost one wrote it, but, but he didn't have an author ascribed to it. Uh, Josephus, the historian, said James the Just wrote it. I don't know who wrote it other than the Holy Ghost. But look what he said in verse 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. 
I got to reading and got to thinking about this. No, there's a lot of places call themselves a church, but they have no right to eat of the altar we have. There's a lot of places that folks are religious, but they have no right to the altar that we've been blessed with. I want to preach with God's help for just a few minutes on we have an altar. 364 times in your King James Bible you'll find the term altar. One day short of our calendar year. Now if you go to Jewish calendar, that's more days than what they have. But 360, just like the Apostle Paul said he died daily, just like the Lord's giving you an altar for every day in the Bible. Are you listening? If you don't talk to God every day and don't find a place where you can separate and get a hold of God, and grab the horns of an altar uh, and get a hold of God, uh, my dear friends, uh, 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 no prayer, no power. That's why a lot of you has you struggle so much. That's why a lot of you uh, uh, have little faith uh, uh, or no faith. Uh, that's why a lot of you uh, 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 just never seem to overcome. Uh, that's why a lot of you, your life is always a uh, 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 constant struggle and hardship. Uh, uh, you haven't learned the secret. Uh, uh, the way up in God's economy is down. Uh, uh, the more you spend on your face and on your knees before God, uh, uh, the more power, the more touch, uh, uh, the more ability you'll have in your life to overcome troubles and struggles. Uh, can I say altars are for repentance? Altars are for re uh, restoration. Altars are for requests to be made known unto God. Uh, altars are a place for reassurance. Thank God I've gotten on an altar. Uh, altars are a place for revival. Uh, altars are a place of reverence uh, uh, where you exalt the Lord uh, and as ascribe to Him the holiness due His name. Uh, in the Bible, like I said, there's many altars mentioned. I'm going to give you a few tonight. A few years ago, I preached a message on the altar will alter you. I got to thinking about some of the altars in the Bible. Can I say tonight there is an earthen altar? Exodus 20, 24 says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me. Uh, an earthen altar is a picture of something. Uh, it's a picture, represents a place uh, where man can do business with God. Uh, we were made of the dust of the earth. Uh, there was an earthen altar. Uh, I'm glad it doesn't matter what side of the tracks you're from. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that it doesn't matter uh, uh, how much or how little you got in your pocket. Uh, I'm glad it don't matter uh, uh, how far you've strayed in sin. Uh, there is an altar available. Uh, uh, where you can come uh, and God will entertain your prayer. Uh, hey, uh, you can try and get a hold of Biden. The FBI is looking for him tonight. Uh, you won't find him. Uh, uh, but I'm telling you, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, uh, uh, the God of all glory, uh, his ears intent into prayer on an earthen altar. Uh, if you come and call uh, and ask God to forgive you if you sin, he will. Hallelujah. There's an earthen altar. Uh, can I say secondly, there's an altar of stone. The Bible says in Exodus 20, 25, uh, And thou shalt make me an altar of stone. Uh, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. Uh, for if thou lift thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Uh, uh, the stone altar that God is referring to, uh, they didn't chisel it out. They didn't take a, 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 an axe or any other tool to it. Uh, uh, my dear friend, uh, how it was formed uh, is how it was to be used. Uh, and that is so important. Uh, why? Uh, it was permanent. Uh, it was substantial. Uh, it was solid. Uh, and it was not tempered by man. Uh, hey, can I say, uh, we have a rock. Uh, he's the rock of ages. Uh, hey, uh, Man could not temper him. Uh, he is the solid rock. Uh, hey, he's the chief cornerstone. Uh, he is our stone. Uh, and friend, you can come and roll it over on him. Uh, and he can handle it. Uh, no matter how big it is. Uh, no matter how hard it is. Uh, it may be too big for you. Uh, but it's not too big for him. Uh, it may be too heavy for you. Uh, but it's not too heavy for him. Uh, Hey, uh, we have a stone altar. Uh, his name is Christ. Uh, and if you can bring it to him, uh, friend, he can handle it. Uh, he said, casting all your cares upon him, uh, for he careth for you. Uh, there's the earthen altar. There's the altar of stone. Uh, 
But then there's the brazen altar that was outside the tabernacle and then the temple. Uh, Exodus 27 gives uh, uh, the law concerning it in verse 1. Uh, Thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long, uh, five cubits broad. Uh, the altar shall be four square, uh, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Uh, thou shalt make uh, the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. Uh, his horns shall be the same, uh, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Uh, it's a brazen altar. Uh, can I say, my dear friends, uh, every time you find brass in the uh, uh, Scriptures, it's always a picture of Jesus. Uh, I'm reminded, my friends, of that brazen serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness. Uh, and can I say the brazen altar uh, is always a picture of Calvary uh, uh, where Jesus uh, took the handwriting of ordinances and the law that were contrary to us uh, and when he took our sins upon himself uh, and he was judged by God uh, uh, for your sin and my sin uh, and he nailed those ordinances to his cross uh, and took them out of the way uh, thanks be unto God for Calvary uh, hey hallelujah uh, it's a place where sacrifice was made uh, and God was pleased uh, and my dear friends uh, uh, you may not see much in me uh, say why are you going to heaven uh, because of Calvary uh, well, why are you so excited uh, because the blood that was shed at Calvary. Uh, hey, uh, songwriters write about it. Uh, singers sing about it. Uh, preachers preach on it. Uh, I never get tired of hearing about the cross uh, where Jesus bled and died. Uh, made a way where old Gentile dogs like you and I uh, could be part of the family of God. Uh, hey, I bless the Lord uh, for the brazen altar of Calvary uh, where God uh, looked at him. Uh, and saw his travail uh, and was pleased with what he did for you and I. Uh, uh, thanks be to God for the brazen altar. Uh, then I thought about this. There's a golden altar. In Exodus 30, verse number 1, the Bible says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shit and wood. Shalt thou make it uh, a cubic uh, uh, shall be the length thereof and a cubic the breadth thereof. Four squares shall it be. Uh, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns uh, thereof shall be of the same. Uh, thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Uh, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about. Uh, and the horns thereof thou shalt make unto the crown of gold round about. Uh, it's a golden altar. Can I say that pictures righteousness? Oh, gold always pictures righteousness. And I say, whoa, all of our righteousness is filthy rags. But there is an altar. <laughs> whoa, it's a golden altar. And if you've been to the brazen altar, you have access to the golden altar. It's an altar of incense. And whoa, I come to God, Brother Brian, not in my righteousness, but I've been robed in His righteousness. When God sees me, don't see my failures. Uh, don't see my faults. Uh, don't see my past. Uh, don't see all of that. Uh, he sees himself, uh, and he's pleased. Uh, and when I get to that golden altar, uh, and I begin to offer up praise on that altar and thanksgiving on that altar, uh, it's a sweet-smelling savor unto God. Uh, Brother Brian, uh, all that used to be, God don't remember uh, but when you get on that golden altar and start thanking him and praising him and tell you, hey, you know what he says? Uh, he says, I'm well pleased uh, in that old boy. Uh, hey, uh, some of them buddies you just run with, uh, uh, they don't understand how you can be sitting on a church pew, uh, but God sees himself sitting there, uh, and he's pleased when you offer up things on that altar. Uh, well, I bless the Lord. Uh Hey, we go over to Revelation 5. It talks about those vials filled of the odors of the saints, the prayers of the saints. What is that? That's those prayers being offered on that golden altar. See, when you're right with God and you start thanking Him and praising Him and telling Him how wonderful He is, all that just brings up, ooh, a sweet-smelling savor unto God. You know what He says? He says, It was worth it! I'm glad I died for Him! Look at the praise they're bringing unto me. I bless his name. It's a golden altar. But then, unfortunately, 
there's altars of idols. First Kings 18. We know the story on Mount Carmel. In verse 26 it says, And they took the bullet which, which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. There's an altar of idols. You say, What in the world is that? Well, that speaks of anything or any place or anyone that we give more significance to than we do God. So I was in church on Sunday. Well, where was you serving Sunday night? Whatever you was doing Sunday nights was offered to an altar of idols. Whatever you was doing Wednesday night when you wasn't in the house of God, if you wasn't providentially hindered, you wasn't working or sick, and I'm talking about sick, gank sick, Offered to an altar of idols. Uh, you see, God's business is serious business, but we, we've listened to, as Brother Bobby calls him, Jolly Olstein so much. That's what he calls him. Joe, it's Jolly. Because he's always happy. He's showing off that million dollar smile people pay for. We've listened to all these feel good preachers so long that as, uh, all they preach is that loves you no matter what you don't have to change God just loves you that we've let them love us right out of the house of God how many people have you heard say well I can serve God on the golf course you can a God a God of, that's an idol I can serve him at the lake yeah you can a, a God that's an idol you can't serve Jehovah God because he said that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hmm? Uh, there's a lot of folks serving and offering up things to an altar that's made to an idol. Hmm? Let me ask you this. Used to, I'd say, the newspaper. Nobody, nobody reads the newspaper anymore. They don't even know what they're. Google it. It's a newspaper. You Google it. You'll find out what it was. What have, let me just say this. Have you done this? Have you read that more in your Bible? That might just be an idol. Say, oh, I've got a Bible app on it. Wonderful. Have you read your Bible app more than you've read the other things on there? This might be an, an idol. Say, Brother Doug, you're meddling. Oh, hang around. I'll get real good and deep in it. Huh? I remember a day and age when you had a pager. You used to have to stop at a pay phone. Google that too. And then we got cell phone. First one I had came in a bag. You carried it. Plugged it into cigarette lighter. Google that too. And everybody started carrying them. Uh, but Bob used to make calls on them. Uh, now we Google on them. Hey, listen. I wear that thesaurus out on mine. How do you think I always alliterate everything? I got a thesaurus on my phone. I got one on my desk. I got one everywhere I go. I wonder how much those things have consumed our lives. Consume us, and how much dust this collects. What are you going to do when they outlaw this thing? They catch you carrying it, they throw you in jail. You better have it memorized and hid in your heart. Hmm? Oh, that went over real well. There's altars of idols, but there's also false uh, false altars. In 2 Kings 16.10, it says, And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath, Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest the fashion of the altar and uh, the pattern of it according to all the workmanship thereof. I wanted Elijah the priest to make the altar just like that. It was a altar. 
is an altar designed for wicked gods. Can I say false altars represent religious rites or practices where the emphasis is placed on works as opposed to the work of God. There's a lot of folks going to so-called churches and going to an altar. It's a false altar. God don't hear the prayers from it. And can I say this sadly? The Bible makes it clear there are deserted altars. In Psalms 84, 3 it says, Yea, the sparrow had found a nest, and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. The altars were not used anymore, and the sparrows were building their nests there. That's pretty bad when a dumb bird has much more respect for the altars of God than God's people did. They're deserted altars. Brother Mike travels and preaches in a lot of churches. And I'm blessed to go a lot. You'd be amazed at how many churches have either removed them or nobody uses them. Deserted. You understand an altar's where God meets with his people. When I became the pastor here 22 years ago in the old building, it didn't have an altar. Because the first thing we designed this church around when we built it was designed around the altar. If you don't have an altar, you don't have the presence of God. Deserted altars. I wonder how long has it been since you've been on an altar? You say, well, I don't have any sin in your life. Well, that's a blessing. I probably think you do, but that's still a blessing. When was the last time you got the altar and you thanked God for how good he's been to you? He only fed you today. He only met every need you had today. You had gas in your tank to get to where you needed to go. Had food to put in your belly. Uh, let you breathe his air. Uh, gave you health enough to be here. Gave you nice clothes. Gave you a nice car. I mean, God's only been good to you. When was the last time you got in the altar and just thanked him? Huh? I don't know how many times I've crawled up in the altar and said, God, I'm not going to ask you for anything. You've been too good to me. I just want to take some time and thank you. Yeah. It's been those times, Brother Jim, before the day's over, it seems like all of a sudden somebody else is giving me something or something else comes my way or something. It wasn't because I asked for it. Because I was thankful. I preached a message a few years ago, but some of you remember. What if you receive tomorrow everything you thank God for today? Hmm? When was the last time you used an altar and just told him you loved him? They're deserted altars. Then the Apostle Paul mentioned an unknown altar in Acts 17.33. He said, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. And we know that he preached God unto them because they had an unknown God. But it was an altar to an unknown God. It was an unknown altar. And can I say... They were concerned, being pagans and worshiping multi-gods there on Mars Hill, that they'd left one out. But can I say, as God's people, there's an unknown altar. There are things that we have not arrived at and don't know yet. Now, we got the book, but half of it's not been told. And we find in, in Corinthians, Paul said that uh, uh, the natural man receiving not the things of God, neither indeed can he, for they are spiritually discerned. But then he goes on and says, but we, but we know these things because the Spirit of God has taught us those things. There are some things that you haven't learned yet because there's an unknown altar you need to get on and say, God, show me what I don't know. God, reveal unto me those places in my life where I need to know more. See, it's an unknown altar. Well, there have been many times I've said, <laughs> I'd be searching, be seeking, be reading every commentary and everything. I can't find it. And finally, I just throw up my hands. I said, well, I probably ought to pray about this thing. Get to talking about to the Lord about it. Before long, he, he, the Spirit of God will show me a verse. I'll go right there, and there's the answer. Hmm? Hmm? There's an unknown altar. It's all unknown because we don't seek after it and don't utilize it. And then, my dear friends, lastly, there's an eternal altar. Revelation 9, 13 mentions it. 
It said, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. You see, when Moses was on the mountain, God blessed him to see the tabernacle in glory. And so he constructed the tabernacle based on the blueprints of what he saw in heaven. And can I say there's an altar before the throne of God? You say, why is there an altar there? That's where God does business, I guess, with us. But there's an eternal altar. And the reason you ought to get used to using it here is there's going to be one wherever we go in the future. But there's an eternal altar. It might just be where God records every sacrifice and everything that's ever been done is reminded to Him on that golden altar. But my dear friends, there's an eternal altar. So if it's going to be an eternity, I want to use it. I want to get practiced up. I don't want to be surprised when I get there. So I wonder, my dear friends, how much does the altar mean to you? In just about every instance, it talked about the horns of the altar. Brother Sidney Weaver and I, he'll text me about every Sunday morning. He'll say, you shuck the corn and I'll shake the horns. What he's saying is, I'll grab a hold of the horns of the altar and be praying while you're preaching. Hmm? Those horns were there. Every now and then you'd have to grab onto to keep your sacrifice from being defiled. And I'm glad there's a place we can grab onto that'll keep us from being defiled. It's at the altar. We have an altar they have no right to. I wonder how significant is the altar to you and to me uh, the altar is a place that ought to be familiar to you and by the way you don't have to wait till you get to church being an altar an altar is anywhere you do business with God but you ought to have a place where you go to where you can just get a hold of God a place that's familiar to you a place where you can pray and touch heaven. I wonder. Do you utilize the altar? The only time you ever pray is when you're in church. God help us. You ought to have a place where you do business with God. You say, why preacher? Because God's willing to do business with us. That's why you ought to want to do business with. Who are we that God would want to do business with? But He is willing to do business. But He asks us to set aside a place. You find in every significant event in the Old Testament, after God did something great, the prophet or the man of God would build an altar. Noah did when he got off the ark. Abraham did in every significant place God met with him. Jacob did. Isaac did. Isaac was known as the well digger, but he built altars. A lot of times he went back and rebuilt the altars of Abraham. I wonder, how important is the altar to you? We have an altar. What a privilege. It's one of the great wonders of the world. It's a place where heaven stops to hear what you have to say. Hmm? I wonder, will you make the altar, the place that we have, an important part of your life? Let's all stand, Brother Clint, if you'll come get a song of invitation. Maybe you need to come and do business with God. The altars are open. Maybe he spoke to you about something specific. Maybe here tonight you're not saved. We'd love to introduce you to the Lord. No better place to meet Him than at the altar. If you come, we'll take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Maybe you need to come tonight and just tell Him you love Him. I don't know. But folks are hitting this altar, but there's room for you. Well, they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the place that we have that the world don't have. A place where we can have an audience with the King of Glory. The altar. God, that's a place where things die. There's a lot of things that in my life I've come brought to an altar, and Lord, they died there. You gave me assurance and hope, peace, rest when I left the altar. 
Lord, there's a lot of folks that came to an altar sinner and left as a saint. Lord, there's a place where an altar where folks worship by thanking you and praising you and adoring and loving on you. Thank you for an altar. God, I pray these in the altar tonight, you'd meet their needs, you'd bless whatever business they're doing with God. God, if others need to come, help them to come. God, especially for somebody here tonight unsaved, Lord, we'd see them come to an old-fashioned altar and meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless this invitation. Speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.